I'd like to give a very warm welcome to Rodrigo Silva Ferreira, who's going to be talking to us today about signal processing and electrochemistry with Python, applications to the U.S. opioids crisis. I'm very excited to hear about it. I hope you are too. Let's give him a round of applause. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon, first of all. And feel free to scan the QR code. It's a bigger version, just in case. And you can find the Q&A link there, and you can ask questions throughout the talk that I will see here. And I can answer along the way or towards the end. So first of all, I just wanted to start with like this basic question, why are we here today? And I think it's very exciting that we are all getting together to learn and to exchange ideas within the community. And with that, I wanted to ask a big round of applause to the staff and to the organization of this amazing event. And yeah, so I will start telling a little bit about myself. My name is Rodrigo. I'm from, uh, originally from Salvador, Brazil. That's a photo of my city. And in the winter, I'm always thinking uh, about going back so that I can enjoy the beach instead of being in cold Pennsylvania. And I work as a software quality engineer at a statistical software company in Central PA. And I got my master's in chemistry from University of Pittsburgh. And my main interest lies in the intersection of statistics, chemistry, and public policy. So the basic idea of um, my side projects is really on how we can leverage statistics and data to understand and improve the, the world. So that's something I really care about. And with that, I can start with a basic overview of the US opioids crisis. Here we have a plot showing the number of deaths related to overdose events across uh, since the 1999. And we have different uh, drugs that are mentioned in the legend below. And a few things that I would like to highlight is that fentanyl, which is in purple among the category of synthetic opioids, has been a major source of concern due to, despite being used for severe pain treatment, it's also used for recreational purposes as well. And it's 20 to 50 times more potent than heroin and 100 times more potent than morphine. It's often consumed as a mixture with other drugs, and that's why it's so concerning. And lastly, it's very addictive and fast acting, meaning that an overdose incident can lead to death very quickly. So the deaths due to the opioids overdose in the US, which fentanyl is one of the most common uh, opioids, has seen a substantial increase across the last 25 uh, years. And as of 2021, the average is 195 daily deaths in the United States due to synthetic opioids in general. And the cost of that in 2020 was around $1.5 trillion. Uh, so it's a very pressing problem that relies on uh, different approaches to solutions. And one of the approaches is leveraging knowledge in analytical chemistry in order to help detect. And with that, I'll just introduce the fentanyl molecule in the middle. And one of the main challenges to detect fentanyl is that you can have a variety of analogs which is essentially when you change uh, functional groups that are part of the molecule in order to obtain other drugs. And that, that becomes a huge challenge because when you're trying to detect fentanyl, but then there is something else that you might need to, to detect, it's impossible. And there are infinite possibilities of analogs that you can generate. And also in terms of the metabolites, 
those are also sometimes analogs like norfentanyl, for example, which is the end result after fentanyl gets metabolized in the body and so on. So we can target fentanyl analogs as well as metabolites in the process. So just to have a reference point here, we have this figure showing the lethal uh, doses of opioids. Like you can see the amount of he heroin that would be considered lethal, along with fentanyl, which one to two milligrams would already be, be lethal. And you can see the amount there comparing with a coin. I think it's a penny, yeah. And some analogs like carfentanyl, for example, the lethal dose is even lower. It's, you can literally just ingest by accident even. So it's a really pressing concern, especially with the emergence of fentanyl being mixed with other drugs. So here we have this table showing the fentanyl in the Ohio uh, drug supply. You can see here that fentanyl is often found mixed with um, heroin 96.6% of the time uh, in heroin samples. There can be uh, fentanyl uh, with that. And as a result, there are a lot of accidental uh, overdose incidents with fentanyl among users of other, other drugs. And in terms of the, now we get to the point, okay, how we can detect this? In terms of the current methods of detection, we have the centralized methods, which are lab-based methods such as uh, HPLC, GCMS, that are expensive and we cannot do on-site detection uh, of fentanyl and the analogs. So that's more like lab analysis. You need a lot of equipment and resources to do so. And then we have the decentralized methods, which are inexpensive, portable, however, they l lack specificity and the limits of detection are not low enough to detect tiny amounts. So, yeah, so th those are two examples. One is a fentanyl reagent that in the presence of fentanyl, it changes uh, color. And the other one is those uh, test strips that are often distributed as in, in harm prevention uh, programs that you can insert in a, a liquid that would contain fentanyl and you can detect it. Even in, in, in urine, it, uh, it could work. Yeah. And then there's an opportunity with electrochemical biosensors, which leverage the uh, specificity and the low sensitivity in order to target uh, fentanyl. And there has been a lot of advancements in this space. There are some papers, for example, on flexible wearable electrochemical sensors that could be used to detect fentanyl for first responders, for example. Here we have an example in a glove sen sensor in a sensing glove, essentially. And here we even have an example of a tattoo-based uh, uh, opioid sensor. And there has been a lot of like more and more advancements with electrochemical test strips, uh, as well as the incorporation of carbon nanotubes to facilitate the process. And lastly, there have been novel approaches to electrochemical data analysis, which is what I would like to focus throughout this, uh, this talk. And there are different, just as, a, as some context, there are different types of electrochemical data that can be obtained by different techniques. Here and here we're going to focus on cyclic voltammetry specifically. And just as a basic background for cyclic voltammetry, and that's the expectation of every electrochemistry when it comes to cyclic voltammetry, is to obtain a duck-shaped signal showing the peak, which can help indicate the, the presence and the concentration of the target uh, substance. So behind this duck-shaped peak, there is a lot of insights that can be obtained um, based on the current versus potential plots. You can obtain based on the peak size, the shift in the potential. You can obtain concentrations, the composition of the mixture, and all of that. So cyclic voltammetry can be really helpful in the context of uh, opioids detection. So that's the expectation, everything uh, perfect. You can detect the, the peaks the, in the redox reactions, and you can get insights 
about what is happening in that, um, in that sample. However, the reality is much more challenging, of course. Sometimes you might get noise signals due to uh, interference with other substances, for example, which is often the case in drug samples. As well as the fact that since we want to target very low concentrations, the peak detection can be compromised by noise as well as impurities. And oftentimes when you get messy data, you might just think that you need to do the experiment over and over again. However, as I explored this topic, I realized that before discarding our mass messy data, you can consider using Python for signal processing. And herein, I will show examples of how we can plot, process, optimize, and then perform statistical analysis on, on the data. So that's essentially the outline of what I will walk through uh, in, in the presentation. And first of all, we can start with the savitsky golai filter, which is uh, very useful for smoothening signals that are originally like noisy. And just as a basic background about the savitsky golai uh, signal, uh, filter, sorry. Uh, so first, we have uh, the equation that it's used to smoothen the signals. One thing that I would like to highlight here is the presence of the convolution coefficients, which are impacted by two parameters, which are window size and polynomial order. So depending on the window size and the polynomial order that you choose in your uh, filtering process, you can obtain uh, different um, smoothened filtered signals. And the benefits of this approach is that you can obtain noise reduction while preserving the main features of the signal, so you're not doing, resorting to uh, distorting the signal, as well as you provide an accurate analysis of what you have, avoiding overfeeding, for example. So I will show what I did with my py uh, Python scripts in order to smoothen a generated uh, noisy signal. And I will show it to you after. So first, I wanted to demonstrate how to use the filter to help optimize cyclic voltammetry uh, signals. I use those tools here. I wanted to highlight that there is already like a self-go filter uh, in, within SciPy signal, so that makes it really helpful. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. And then the CV data obtained from publicly available uh, data. And in terms of the combination, first I took the approach of using the best combinations I, I could find and hard coding it. And I introduced noise levels of 0%, 10%, 30, 50, 70, 90, and 100. The, the reason why I do 0 and 100 is just for like reference. It's like positive control and negative control. And I put a seed 30 just for reproducibility purposes. But you can put any, you don't have to put a seed to, to generate the noise. Okay, so here is my script for the application of the Savitsky Google Life filter. And I wanted to highlight some reasons why I selected specific ranges or why I did specific things. For the peaks, I select between minus 0 0.5 volts and 0 0.2, just because that's where the peak is found. For then I filtered non-positive values because I also wanted to obtain the mean square logarithm uh, error. And then in order to prevent a lot of uh, non-positive values to show up, we can just add one inside the log function. And that's like basic logarithm that, that wouldn't influence the, the results since we are just comparing. And for the mean square error calculations, we don't need to get rid of the non-positive uh, values. 
and then we average the signals, you store them in PICO files. And I found those like PICO files storage really cool method just because uh, we can, it's just the concept of essentially storing it in a jar and retrieving the bytes of information in Python when you need to actually compare. So now we get to the actual plots. So those are the four models that I put for the window size and polynomial orders. And then as you can observe, that is just 0%. But then as we apply noise, it becomes more challenging to feed the signal. And then we keep going 30%, which is a lot, 50%, 70, 90, and then 100. And just to really analyze whether the models are good at filtering the noisy, the generated noisy signals. I plotted here the bar charts for the MSLE and the MSE with the error bars. And what we can essentially he see here after performing one way ANOVA uh, is that there's no statistically significance and different am difference among the four m models, showing that the four are really like good um, more or less equally. So then I went to a second approach, which is implementing hyperparameter optimization to search for the best uh, values for my, different, uh, my two different variables. And to do that, I, it used this tree structured uh, parson estimator approach, which is essentially as if you're going through a tree and based on the algorithm, it can choose the best branch and sub-branches to go through instead of doing a search aco across all search space or me having to guess the best values. Uh, libraries like H Hyper OPT can help to really optimize the, ser the search and to select the best values. So that's the idea behind the, um, the tree structure uh, parsing estimator is that you have uh, the hyperparameter search that looks for values that result in the lowest losses. And then you have the expected improvement uh, optimization um, in order to have the best results. So that was, that's the, theory behind what I did. And for the hyper OPT, I used only 20 trials, which is really low. And my, the curiosity behind that was to understand whether there was a difference between the best results that I had uh, hard coded before versus the approach of hyper uh, OPT. And again, stored in the Pico jar. And those are the plots, just go through them quickly. And then we get to the results again. Comparing the p-values uh, again, we see that among the four models, there is no statistically significant difference. And then I went to my script number three, which I wanted to know, okay, was there a difference between the two approaches, like hard coding the best values versus doing the hyper OPT search. So that's time for like actually making the pickle juice, which is the statistical analysis. And that's the output that, uh, that I got. And there is essentially no statistically significant difference between the two sets of average MSL MSLEs and MSEs as well. So the conclusion is that we have three ways to approach optimization. We can guess values that yield lowest average errors, which is difficult, of course. We can conduct trials across all the search space, which can be a waste of computing resources and, and time, depending on the situation. Or we can use hyper OPT to optimize guesses, which again, depends on the context. In some contexts, it's not really necessary to do that could just go through all the search space. And in others, it can be really helpful. Yeah. 
And then another approach that you can extract more information from um, from your noise CV signals is with discrete Fourier transformation. That's just some like of the theory, and I want to highlight the amplitude spectrum for uh, the for each frequency component and how it can be helpful, and I will show later. The main advantage is the ability to decompose mixed signals. So let's say if you have different drugs mixed in a sample, you, you could be able to decompose the signals using Fourier transform. So that's what I did with my script. Those are the different steps. And yeah. So again, those libraries already exist and it's really handy to apply to what your needs are. So finally, I want to show here the two signals. In green, we have the original cyclic voltammeter data. In red, we have an example of an interfering substance that uh, I generated. And then in blue, we have the combined signal. So usually if you have a sample and you run a CV experiment, you would only get the blue, blue signal and it would be really difficult to decompose it. How, however, you can have standards of the two other substances that resulted into the blue signal and you can use those standards and their chemical signatures to, um, to determine if there is something else in the mixture. So once we dec uh, decompose using the Fourier transform, you can see that between the fourth and sixth uh, uh, harmonics, like specifically at five, we can see that there is a difference between the three signals, in red for the interfering substance, in green for the uh, original substance, and in blue for the mixture itself. So by tracking those difference between a bunch of different substances, it could be very helpful in the context of electrochemical detection of drugs. And finally, I'll go on to discrete wavelet transform and how it can also be useful for noisy signals. And what I want to emphasize here is that for wavelet transform, you can have approximation and detailed coefficients. So I like to think of it like a hand that for the approximation, you're just looking at the general shape of the hand. Whereas for the um, detailed coefficients, you're actually looking at the lines that you have in the palm and so on. And this really helps to establish a balance between decomposing the, the signal in a way that you can see the details of it while preventing uh, overfitting of the, of the data. So you can obtain the detailed coefficients, like through the high frequencies, as well as the approximation coefficients through the uh, low frequencies. So yeah, and for the, for the script itself, that's how, how I did it, some screenshots. And I used DB4, which is useful due to the uh, comp compact support, first of all. That's a type of wavelet uh, analysis. And it's useful because outside of the finite interval of your data, it's uh, zero, uh, essentially. So it doesn't mess up with the analysis. It's also useful due to the ortho orthogonality because it allows to reconstruct the signal without overlapping in the frequency domain. And finally, it has uh, four vanishing moments. That's why it's called DB4, meaning it's able to capture details of your uh, rec recomposed signal up to degree three of the signal. So I'll just show here that that's applying noise, essentially to the original signal. And then I'll jump to 10%. We can see here that for, let me zoom, zoom in a little bit. 
like we can see here that for each uh, noise signal we 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 get within each level one two three four of the coefficients we get a reconstructed uh, plot that resembles up to a certain level resembles the plot of the original signal so that's another approach to really reconstruct uh, messy uh, signals but again it only goes up to a certain extent at some point you reach the limit in which you can no longer r accurately reconstruct your signal and the, the more you go the more like challenging it becomes to reconstruct and uh, messy essentially so at 100% it's almost impossible to reconstruct any signal so yeah so by the way I put the five different scripts in in a repo that anyone can uh, can fork or clone it and I think it's very important here to understand how Python can really help uh, us like process data in order to obtain uh, better insights about it because in the science field it's often that once you obtain bad data you just toss it away you just think oh no it's not good I need to repeat the experiment I need to do the same thing a hundred times more and so on in order to obtain the good data but in reality even with mass data we can really obtain a lot of information that can be helpful for future detection of those uh, of those substances and i will share finally the uh, key takeaway takeaways of my talk so here we went through different signal processing techniques starting with the savitsky goli filter which is useful for filtering and smoothening uh, noisy data. Then we talked about Fourier transform, which can be helpful in the scenario of interfering substances and how we can extract more information in order to distinguish them based on the different chemical signatures. And finally, we went over wavelet transform, which really has the potential to uh, dissect uh, noisy data into different levels allowing matching with the uh, in my case allowing matching with the original signal and so on so if you have if you in the future if you start extracting more information and establishing some sort of database with standard substances it can become easier in the process of the, the development of electrochemical sensors geared towards opioids for example and that's why this is uh, relevant in electrochemistry because it enables enhanced data processing which is useful for getting more information out of massive signals and this can be used in the, de in the detection of, of opioids due to the need for high sensitivity due to the low, uh, low lethal doses for example so we really want to make very sensitive uh, electrochemical sensors as well as due to the need for selectivity because we want to distinguish between substances um, opioids fentanyl analogs a bunch of substances that can be found together we want to be able to distinguish between them and overall I just really care about using like statistics data to like improve the world and to understand the world better and that's why I decided to, to do this talk. And lastly, I have the references here. And in case you're interested in this research, you can check out the STAR Research Group website from the University of Pittsburgh. And that's all for today. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to, to ask. And yeah, so that's my, my talk. <laughs>